Hello to everybody. This is the last uh, lecture of this bunch of <laughs> this session, let's say, of the Heisenberg's Guide to the Condensed Matter and Statistical Physics. And um, for us, it's a pleasure to have here Juan, Car Juan Carrasquilla. Sorry, I should do it. <laughs> and Juan Carrasquilla, now it's a faculty member at the Vector Institute. And it's also assistant professor at the University of Waterloo, if I read it correctly. He's working in the, at the intersection between condensed matter, quantum computing, and machine learning. He's there in the middle. He's there in the middle. And he's a former diploma student of the ICTP. He's a success history for, for our diploma. And also a former student of PhD here at CISA, right? Always interested. Uh, from that, I think he has moved and starts doing several postdocs in the US. And now he's at Waterloo. So please, Juan, whenever you want, you can start. Okay, thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so it's very a great pleasure to be at ICTP, to be back at ICTP, although this is uh, uh, an online talk. Um, I'm always very happy to, uh, to come. Um, so yeah, so I wanna tell you about um, recurrent neural networks and how we've been using them for many body physics. So the first part is going to be about uh, basic uh, notions, and um, yeah, let's let's just get uh, started. And uh, so here, my uh, like some my people funding my research, and the Vector Institute on University of Waterloo as well. Um, so, so what are recurrent neural networks, and why they're useful, and why we think they're powerful uh, tool to study many body physics. So. Let me tell you first what they are. So uh, some generalities about what they are. So there are a family of um, neural networks that are naturally suited for processing sequential data. So this is something, this is how people talk about this RNNs, but you can process any data basically. But, uh, but in principle, they're naturally uh, suited for processing data that uh, comes in a sequence or in an order, right? And so the sequence that I'm gonna be using for, uh, throughout my talk, if you want, is like a sequence of uh, say spin variables, sigma one, sigma two, through sigma n. And you can imagine them, they're um, kind of like placed on a line, if you want, okay? Or you can think of uh, this index i, one, two, three, to n as time, for instance. And so the idea is that recurrent neural networks uh, can typically scale much better to longer sequences than uh, would be practical for other neural network architectures that, um, you may have seen already last uh, couple of weeks, like uh, the restricted Boltzmann machine, which I'm sure you, you've seen uh, last week and so on. So there's this uh, specialization um, for sequences with the RNA or for the RNA. And so this is part of like this, um, if you want this conceptual idea that you can, by um, exploiting the structure of the problem, uh, that you can make progress uh, computationally, right? Like, and so we, we're gonna be using this idea a lot um, and people in machine learning use it all the time, right? Like that when you have a, a problem, you want to see what's the structure of the problem and you use the information um, about the problem to, to solve it, right? And this is something that we in physics do all the time. We use uh, symmetries and, and so on. And this, if you want, enriches the, our understanding of the problem, but also it um, saves us, uh, if you want, computational time. And so we do the same in machine learning or people have been, uh, using this idea in machine learning as well. Um, so most recurrent uh, neural networks can process uh, sequences of variable length. That's uh, important. So this uh, sequence that I have here, this vector sigma can have um, say uh, either two spins or n or n plus one. And um, this uh, architecture can process all those um, uh, variable length uh, sequences. So that's important. Uh, like for instance, in language translation and in, um, in yeah, in, in general, in natural language processing, which is one important task people in machine learning are interested in. Um, so what to do? Uh, so we to go from a multi-layer neural network 
such as like the RVM uh, or the restricted Boltzmann machine that you have seen last week, I believe, uh, what you do is you share parameters across different parts of the model, okay? So, and I'm gonna explain what this is in a little bit. And this is also what people use in, um, in computer vision in, a, in, a, in another famous architecture called uh, convolutional neural network, okay? Which is uh, right here as a CNN. There's this uh, idea also very popular in physics and in machine learning, which is share the parameters um, of, the, uh, of a model as you say process things over time or spatially, right? Like that you, share, you share the parameters and this makes the parameters um, uh, like or the neural net uh, more compact, but also more efficient at processing some sort of uh, data, okay? And so if um, we compare this so-called feed-forward neural network, such as the restricted Boltzmann machine, uh, so what you have is something like this, where each input, uh, say sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, is a process with their own set of parameters, right? Like, so for instance, I have highlighted here sigma zero and sigma three, and they, as, the, uh, as the information about these variables is processed through the architecture, in this case, vertically, you, you process sigma zero with this, its own set of parameters, right? Like, uh, which I denote here in yellow, uh, whereas sigma three is processed with a different set of parameters here in um, purple, okay? And so that's that's how you do it in a feed for a neural network, but in a, re a recurrent neural network, you do something a little bit different, right? Like you, you process uh, sigma zero with um, variable W, for instance. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be explaining all these plots in a little bit more detail later, but, uh, but the important thing I want to highlight here is that uh, you process the sigma zero with uh, parameter W, and then uh, you process sigma one, and then you reuse the same parameter w, right? Like, uh, and, and so on and so forth for sigma two and sigma three. So each input is processed through the same parameters, say u and w and u, like where u are those here. I'm gonna be explaining this in detail, this architecture. Um, this is, this blocks here, are the, the so-called recurrent cells, and I'm gonna be giving you examples of those, or one example of those. And, and so this, uh, if you want, this parameter sharing is what makes this uh, RNNs uh, powerful and um, uh, and compact, uh, and also en enable you to uh, have this um, variable uh, length input. So that's how you say do this conceptual uh, um, leap of going from this uh, more traditional feed-forward neural network into a, the RNN uh, with parameter sharing. Um, so I'm gonna. I'm going to introduce recurrent neural networks as um, as models uh, for probability distributions. So this is not the only way you can use them. You can use them in any many other ways, but this is, if you want, what I'm going to focus on. Um, and so let's get started, like with the, with the definitions on the math. So consider a probability distribution defined over a discrete uh, sample space. So the sample space is uh, sigma, where sigma are a collection of variables sigma one, two, three, to so sigma n, and each of this uh, sigma n can take um, uh, d uh, new values. So it can go from zero, one, uh, two, three, up to d um, new minus one. So that's um, if you want a spin configuration, if uh, sigma like a spin one half configuration, for instance, or spin very easing variables. Uh, uh, sigma, where like you have zero or one or plus or minus one, uh, but you can also do like higher dimensional um, uh, systems. Um, so the probability of uh, observing sigma, p sigma is just uh, this uh, uh, quantity here, p sig of sigma one, sigma two through sigma n. And <clears throat> so one important thing that I'm gonna be uh, using is the so-called chain rule of probability, which allows you to write down um, P of sigma in terms of uh, it's uh, conditional. So this is very, this is general, this is exact. So it's P of sigma one times P of uh, sigma two condition on uh, sigma one um, uh, and so on, all the way up to P of sigma n condition on uh, sigma one, sigma two, uh, all the way through sigma n minus one. So this is important uh, and is the basis of how we build the RNN, okay? Uh, so I'm, I introduced this uh, shorthand notation for the conditional sigma i 
um, condition on sigma one through sigma i minus one as sigma i condition on the, the sigma less than i. Okay, this is a short for conditionals. Uh, so here, um, uh, the, what, like there's one important observation, which is if you wanted to specify every conditional um, uh, in the chain rule, uh, so this gives a full description of the uh, of any possible distributions of, of this type. Okay. Um, however, uh, this characterization is uh, very expensive. In general, the representation, either directly writing all these probabilities or writing all the conditionals, is a representation that uh, grows exponentially with the size of the system n. Meaning that if you specify all the possible values for the conditional distribution, this is an exponential number of, um, it's a big table with uh, an exponential number of entries. And so we, uh, there's no hope we can uh, use it for practical purposes, right? And the question is, can we alleviate this explosion? And the idea then is, yes, we will, and we'll, we'll exploit the structure of the problem to, to alleviate this uh, complexity, which is something that we, uh, in physics, we do pretty much all the time, right? Like, for instance, in, in tensor networks, what you do is you have this exponentially uh, complex, uh, uh, complicated wave functions, and then what you do is you write uh, an approximation in terms of uh, say matrix product states, which uh, if you want alleviate that complexity. So what we do here is the same, right? Like or is similar in that uh, we're trying to alleviate this um, exponential complexity by uh, exploiting some structure of the problem, right? And the idea is that um, nature is benevolent and uh, real world uh, problems have enough structure that we can use it uh, um, like when we can use far fewer resources to solve these problems or to tackle this problem, right? Um, and so uh, RNNs, what they do is exactly that, which is they can parameterize this probability distributions, uh, P uh, sigma entirely uh, through the conditionals, right? Like, so basically what we do is we are parameterizing each of the conditionals in the, in the chain rule here, okay? So that's what the RNN does in, in this, Ironists do many things, but this is, if you want, the, the when way I'm going to be explaining them. So, so then the elementary building block of an RNN is a, a so-called a recurrent cell, which is, uh, uh, if you want, helps us specify the condition, okay? And the simplest uh, recurrent neural network, people call it vanilla RNN because it's the simplest, is just a nonlinear function that maps uh, concatenation of a B H dimensional vector with uh, uh, with an input vector uh, sigma that represents the if you want the spin configuration or this variable up or down or one or c, and then you map this um, uh, concatenation through a nonlinearity and then you end up with a new vector H uh, n which is uh, this uh, here. It's also D H dimensional. So that's all uh, it is. It's a nonlinear function applied to a linear transformation or an affine transformation on um, on on uh, this uh, vec this uh, state vector or hidden vector concatenated with the input. Okay, uh, and that's that's all what, what that's all it is. And um, uh, f is a nonlinear activation function, typically a sigmoid function. Um, and then what are the parameters of the RNN is so it's a wave matrix uh, W with dimensions. Uh, they're, they're usually real, but you can also use complex numbers. Uh, so it's DH uh, times uh, DH plus DV, which is, so DH is the dimension of this hidden vector and the nu is the dimension of the input, okay? And then the bias vector is, uh, R, uh, in, it's in the RDH, so the dimension of the hidden state. So, uh, the state, so, we, so we're going to be using this uh, uh, expression uh, as a recurrence. You go, you, see from, you go from a given vector h n minus 1 to h n, so this is a recurrent relation. And so we have to initialize h uh, 0 and sigma 0 to something um, to, to get the calculation going. And we initialize them to zeros, but any constant um, vectors work. Um, and then something that I didn't specify is like, I have this uh, sigma in bold. I don't know if it was difficult to notice, but it's just a uh, vector that represents each uh, spin configuration. And what these are is 
uh, the so-called one-hold encodings of the input. Uh, for instance, so uh, if you have some input that is either one or zero, then I'm going to replace that by a uh, like tiny vector with dimension two, where uh, one, for instance, uh, where, where zero corresponds to one zero and one corresponds to uh, zero one. Um, and and uh, so that's if you want for convenience. Um, so so then, so how uh, do we proceed? So we uh, proceed computing all these conditionals that I was mentioning in the chain rule uh, through this expression. So each conditional sigma n, conditional uh, sigma one through sigma n minus one is a dot product um, uh, y n times uh, sigma n, this uh, one hot encoding, uh, where this dot is just the scalar product and this um, y n is, a, Yet again, uh, an extra layer in the RNN. And I'm going to be explaining how this looks like graphically in a bit to make things a little bit more fun. So it's a softmax, um, so called softmax layer, um, where you take this uh, recurrent vector Hn, you add this vector, and then you apply this nonlinearity we call softmax. And um, uh, so the, the, the softmax activation function is given by this exponential of uh, the components of whatever you put there divided by, by the sum over the vectors so that it is normalized. Um, Juan, uh, there is a question related with the previous slide. I think we can stop and okay, we yeah. can go to the, uh, can you elaborate the condition on the dimension of the weight matrix? Why is that, is that much specific? Um, let me see. So, on the condition um, on the weight matrix. So yeah. so yeah, so we have this weight matrix here. And um, so what, what it does is basically the, it, it contains the parameters of the model and the dimensions of it is uh, they're related to the power of the model, right? Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's here. So the power of the model, if you want the expressive power of the, of the model is encoded in this dimensional, uh, like the dimensionality of the hidden vector um, H, which is this uh, DH here, okay? And so the, this is tied to the size of the matrix. And so the dimensionality of, um, uh, of this, if you want this weight matrix, um, is, uh, is, is this one here and it's tied to the, um, to the expressive power of the model. I don't know if that um, answers the question. Maybe we can allow the... Uh, uh, Rajiv uh, to, to be more specific. Hello. Hello. Hi, you, you, and you answered my question. Thanks a lot. Yes, I, I got my answer. Okay, great, great. And then there's a question by Shayuni. So I was wondering where or how does the fact that the hidden layers are connected, uh, the hidden layers enter the activation function? Let me see. So the, the hidden uh, layers. Uh, enter in the activation function uh, through through this expression in here. So, so the hidden uh, state of the of the model is H, right? And uh, you apply this nonlinearity to the concatenation of H and the input, and that's how um, you process information in this architecture. And uh, so, yeah, so it goes through, yeah, in the, through the um, uh, I mean, the, this is how the how the uh, activation function uh, is connected to the nonlinearity is through this recurrent relation. Okay, hope that uh, answers the question. Um, thank you uh, all for the questions. Um, so yeah, so I was uh, here. I was at this uh, extra layer of uh, the recurrent neural network. Uh, which is the softmax, and the softmax ultimately provides the probability, the conditional, right? Like because so this expression, as long as u uh, and c are real, and as long as everything is real, then you have um, that uh, this s, the softmax layer, gives you a conditional distribution or a probability distribution that we interpret as a conditional. 
okay? Uh, and that's uh, how you get uh, this conditional distribution. Um, and then ultimately you have done all this, like the computation of all this conditional sequentially, what you do is you can then compute the probability of the entire configuration sigma by uh, multiplying. So the chain rule had, had all those multiplications, right? Like all these conditionals come multiplied. And so that corresponds to this multiplication here. Uh, so there's uh, three important things that, um, that I want to highlight that I think are very powerful about this model, which is, so one of them is the fact that uh, P is normalized, okay? As opposed to, for instance, uh, like energy-based uh, models or probabilistic models based on, uh, on, an, on an easing Hamiltonian, where the, you need to compute the partition function if you want to get, say, P of uh, sigma, which is very challenging for some of these models. So in this case, there's no issue. You can, uh, I mean, the model is normalized, which is, I think, a very powerful thing to do. Um, and then sampling the probability distribution uh, is achieved in a sequential fashion. So you sample each conditional uh, sequentially, and then um, <clears throat> at the end of uh, that process, which you do say n times, then you are um, guaranteed you uh, have an exact sample of the model. Okay, so there's no need for um, say there's no need to perform more Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations to get uh, samples from this model, which is again very powerful, I think. Um, uh, and so I wanted to highlight those two. So this is a graphic representation of the RNN. So here is the input. Uh, you send the input to the cell, which is this um, expression here that I was referring to. Um, you compute this recurrence, and then you use this uh, vector HN to compute the conditional using the softmax. And at the end, you get this uh, nice mm, conditional, uh, this parametrization of the conditional. This is, uh, uh, if you want a graphic representation of the fact that this uh, cell is used on and on. So you use, you, you take uh, this uh, HN minus one, you send it to the recurrent uh, expression, and then you get HN. So this is a graphical representation. This is the most compact. But there's also an unrolled version of this cartoon, which is um, you initialize at h0 <clears throat> and sigma zero. You do this uh, cal little calculation in terms of this recurrent uh, recurrence relation and um, uh, softmax, which gives you the conditionals. Uh, you get p of uh, uh, sigma one. You uh, then uh, use sigma one to compute uh, p of uh, sigma one condition and sigma. Uh, uh, sorry, see P of sigma two condition of sigma one and so on. So this is kind of like an, an enrolled version of the recurrent neural network where each box is uh, this ex either this expression with the corresponding uh, hidden vectors uh, hn minus one and hn and the parameters of them. And this is how you like, if you want, how you compute uh, the, this distribution, right? Like P sigma, you just, Take, uh, for instance, if you're computing the first term in this expression, what you do is you take this um, y1, they've cut the computation of the first uh, step of the RNN, and you multiply it by sigma one, um, and and so on. You keep doing this on and on until you get all the distribute, like the value of uh, the probability of some configuration. Um, maybe uh, there's three questions. Maybe I can answer them uh, right now. So I was wondering if the activation function relate to the partition function and what so the so I, I, so the question is I was by Joseph so I was wondering if the activation function um, relate to partition function and why and I think so it does right it relates to the, uh, the partition function because when you uh, compute the partition function it's a sum over all the possible values of uh, Sigma and uh, that gives you one that by construction uh, and so um, let me see. So, okay, the model is normalized by, by construction, so the partition function is not even there. But um, if there was a partition function, you could write it in terms of um, uh, of the activation function. That's what I think. But but the partition function is. I mean, the model is normalized, so there's no partition function uh, per se. Um, and the second question is, do you apply any cutoff on the conditional probability? 
Okay, so this is so this is a good question. So do you apply any cutoff on the conditional probability? Say p of sigma n um, is equal to p of uh, sigma n condition only on say a few of uh, the variables. And the answer is uh, so in 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 the, in principle no, but um, but because uh, I mean we never apply this the so-called Markov condition, so we don't use it uh, to in the definition of the model. But in practice, um, as you process information, this uh, vector h uh, that is passed uh, uh, between the different steps in the unrolling of the RNN, um, I mean, this can only carry some a certain amount of information. This is why this vector is called memory vector. And so um, in practice, what happens is that uh, if you have a, a, a dimension dh of the hidden vector that is not too big, then practically, uh, the correlation between one variable uh, sigma, um, say sigma one, and the correlation between some sigma i, uh, so one plus a uh, ten becomes weaker and weaker. Okay, um, becomes it's actually I think for most architectures it decays exponentially. So it's uh, similar in the sense, um, yeah. So it decays, it decays, right? Like it depends on how powerful the model is, but in, in practice there's some cutoff, right? Mm, it's just that this cutoff is not imposed by hand by using some of these Markov conditions that uh, Mahmoud is uh, talking about. That's a good question. Um, so maybe I can answer one more. So the statement uh, that the samples aren't correlated is really powerful. How does this relate to numerical precision when calculating an observable uh, in comparison with the Monte Carlo methods? So this is a good question. So the idea is that uh, when you do Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, you have some autocorrelation time uh, that you have to, if you want, uh, use or to explore such that when you compute expectation values uh, using these samples out of a Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, are correct, right? Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, if you don't explore that and you use correlated samples, then you start introducing a bias in the expectation values of your um, of uh, of your quantity of interest. What I'm saying is, uh, in here, this um, autocorrelation is zero, basically, and so you 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 know that uh, given the architecture you have, given the model you have, this um, expectation values are unbiased, right? Uh, whereas in Monte Carlo, in general, they are biased if you. Uh, because I mean, guaranteeing like that you're not using correlated samples is difficult. Although in practice, what we do is we do some sort of uh, binning analysis that we, so that we make sure that the samples are really uncorrelated. But uh, but what I'm saying is that um, you just don't have to worry about this anal type of analysis anymore because the samples are um, um, are uncorrelated. So that's a good question. There's also one question: at what condition this becomes unstable? as nonlinear uh, signal is being considered. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you speak, uh, Sri Harsha? Uh, yes, uh, here in this scenario, you are trying to use the uh, sigma function, right? Which is a nonlinear signal. Mm -hmm. So at which condition this becomes unstable? So, so there are, uh, if you are considering like dynamical systems or uh, uh, in this case, like uh, there will be like some stability at what point of time the system is stable and what point of time this becomes unstable. What is the condition? Uh, so I don't have a good answer to that question. So, but I, I understand. So this makes sense or not. I'm not sure, but I just wanted to give you a try uh, whether it is correct or not. No, it is. It is correct. And uh, mm, so I think so. I don't know of examples where this uh, happens. So I understand where you're coming from. This can be understood as a dynamical system. Uh, but as far as I know, for this uh, systems that I know, um, every time. Uh, so you can also think of this as a um, as a map, right? It is a map, right? Like and and so what you like uh, typically what happens is you flow toward some fixed point. That's what I, like what happens in my experiences. You always flow to uh, either A or B point or, or C, right? Like uh, so, I've never seen instabilities, right? Like what I see is some so form of saturation in this um, in these models when understood as a dynamical system. Um, okay. 
yes, so this uh, this area still need to be explored right this point of uh, concept has to be still explored i think there's some work on this uh, along like uh, the um mm, like the, the dynamical properties of RNN, but I, I'm not very familiar with it. But in practice, I've never seen, um, um, because everything is properly normalized, there's no, I mean, there's no explosion uh, of uh, anything uh, in here. Okay. okay. This one will be in periodic sense or this one will be non-periodic? Any condition? I don't think it's, it's not periodic. As far as I know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So there's also a question. So uh, can sigma be a matrix? I think so. It can be a matrix. You can uh, indeed reshape. I, I mean, anything can be a matrix in some sense. But yeah, it can be a matrix. All right, let me go ahead. That I'm running out of time. So this is um, how we compute this. Then how you do sample is a little bit similar, right? Like, so what you do is you initialize uh, H0, sigma zero, you compute the first conditional P uh, sigma one, then you sample this. You can use uh, a random generator. I mean, it's just a sampling either up or down uh, and you're given the probability you sample, you get sigma one, like the first sample, sigma one. You bring it here, you um, input uh, sigma one here and you compute P2, uh, sorry, P sigma 2 condition on the sigma 1 that you observed here. Uh, you sample again, this is again two numbers, uh, P of probability of up and down. If this is a two dimensional system, you get sigma 2, you store it, you bring it here, sample P3 uh, condition on uh, sigma um, uh, 2 and 1, you get sigma 3, you bring it here. You keep repeating this on and on, and that's how you get a sample. So it's very easy to, and uh, it gives you exact samples, as I was saying. Um, so that's it for probabilities. Let me quickly go through uh, how can you send this to quantum uh, many body systems, okay? Which is uh, the next uh, part, which is RNN wave functions. Uh, so there's an important, so let me first tell you about a first, about an important class of. Um, so called stochastic Hamiltonians or stochastic many body Hamiltonians, they have ground states uh, sigma, uh, uh, sorry, psi, with uh, strictly real and positive amplitudes in the standard computational basis sigma. So now I'm promoting sigma um, to a uh, quantum uh, basis, if you want, or a uh, basis set. And uh, so now there, this uh, cat. And so you define uh, the ground state of a stochastic Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, like in this form, and you can interpret that uh, ground state as the square root of a probability distribution without, um, uh, uh, but like when you restrict uh, to, Hamil to ground states of Hamiltonians that are so-called stochastic Hamiltonians. And so it is natural then to use the recurrent neural network to, to represent this wave function, right? So what you're doing is kind of like a coherent, coherent superposition of um, the RNN and that's, our RNN wave function, which we uh, explored in this uh, paper by my graduate student, Mohammed Kibat Allah. Uh, so however, wave functions are complex in general, and so you, we need a phase. And um, there's a simple way to introduce a phase. So let me, let me tell you about, about how we did it. So what we did was, so this is the usual, uh, the RNN that, we, that, we, that I explained a little bit earlier, uh, where we just, make a coherent superposition of the probabilities, right? Or the square root of the probability. So you can define a wave function or this wave function through the usual RNN. However, if you wanna have a complex value um, wave function, what you can do is you can add an extra layer on top of uh, the softmax. So here we have the softmax layer, which is what we had originally. Now we have a, a so-called soft, um, phase or soft sign uh, layer that computes a phase or a phase give for every conditional, okay? And that's what we've done here. So it just adds a few more parameters to the RNN and, and then you use those parameters to estimate some uh, phase, uh, phi one, phi two, phi three, all the way through phi n. And then um, 
let me give you the details. So the soft sign layer, we call it soft sign, is basically this, uh, this expression here. You use, uh, you multiply by pi times this um, soft sign function, which is basically uh, this expression here. It's x divided by one plus uh, absolute value of x. So this is uh, between minus one and one. Um, and so if you multiply it by pi, it looks like a phase. In, uh, and then the overall phase of the wave function is just the sum of all uh, the phases at each uh, site or at each uh, spin. Okay. Um, uh, so now let me, uh, I think in the last few minutes I have, let me tell you, so that's all about the architectures and the basics of the RNN. But let me tell you how to train these models. Uh, and I'm going to give you uh, hopefully two or three, exa three examples of uh, how you can train this. So, so in machine learning, which is that if you want the most the, the traditional way people do it in machine learning is uh, you take a big bunch of data from a probability distribution you observed in nature, such as like uh, images uh, on the internet or um, a collection of uh, words in a book. Uh, and then you can do the so called or use the so called maximum likelihood uh, estimation or maximum likelihood principle. And so, what you can do is you to estimate the parameters of the RNN, we can use this principle. This principle is very simple, it's um, but also a very deep idea. So, uh, the parameters of the statistical model, which is our recurrent neural network, are selected by assigning high probability to the data you observe. So, this makes sense because. Uh, you, you, you imagine you're sampling some probability distribution, for instance, the probability distribution of uh, natural images. So the images you take with a camera. Um, and so the, what you get out of the camera, it's, uh, you, I mean, it has high probability of occurring because it happened, right, like in nature. So that's the idea that uh, when you sample experimentally from a probability distribution, the observations that you see have high probability. And so we should assign them, if, you, if you're fitting that data to uh, a probabilistic model, we should give them high probability, right? That's the idea. Uh, so that's the, the principle of the a maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and so you, you're given a data set, a sigma hat, which is a collection of data points, uh, sigma n. And then uh, what you do is you compute the probability of that data under the model. And that's called the likelihood. Okay, so and you assume that this uh, samples you got um, in the data are uncorrelated. Okay, and so the probability of observing that data set is the product um, of the probabilities assigned by the model P theta. So P theta is going to be the RNN, um, and where the parameters of the RNN are encapsulated in this variable theta. Okay, so that's the idea. So you can maximize this uh, quantity with respect to theta. Um, however, um, uh, it is, uh, so since probabilities are between zero and one, if you multiply too many of them, this number, this likelihood function is gonna be eventually very small, okay? Uh, and so what you do is you say, okay, instead of uh, uh, using the likelihood function, I'm gonna define for numerical convenience the negative uh, logarithm of the likelihood, okay? Which is um, simply you take the minus the log and then you end up with this expression here, okay? Which is way better to handle numerically. And instead of maximizing the likelihood because you put a minus sign here, then you minimize this uh, negative log likelihood, okay? And what you do is you use gradient descent techniques, which you, you saw, I think, last week, okay? so. So what are the ingredients of uh, this optimization or this minimization using gradients? So first you have to compute the gradient in the data uh, of this uh, negative log likelihood. And then you, uh, to do that, you use some uh, like algorithm called back propagation through time, okay? Which is basically uh, using the chain rule on that function defined by the RNN, okay? Um, so I, I have the slides at the end, but uh, I won't have time. It's very clear to me that I won't have time. Um, and so uh, let's just leave it like that, but I encourage you to take a look at this um, uh, uh, link. 
it has a derivation of the back propagation. So basically the derivation of the gradients of uh, this, uh, the RNN with respect to its uh, parameters. Um, and this is a course by a colleague of mine, Roger Gross, it's very, very clear. Um, and then what you do is you do a parameter update following this, this the direction of the steepest descent, which is basically you replace theta but by theta minus uh, some small parameter um, alpha times the gradient, and you iterate this uh, until you get a convergence, okay? The hard part is using these derivatives in, in optimization because they can um, explode or vanish. And this is related to the question about the stability. So there's no problem in the calculation of the probabilities, but the, the gradients can, uh, can become very high or very small. And this is, if you want a consequence of like um, understanding this um, system as a dynamical one. And then for the point of view of the gradients, there's some issues. And so you need to uh, optimize the architecture so that um, this is uh, improved. Um, and then uh, finally, we're gonna be using uh, as a different method of training in physics, we were often given um, Hamiltonian, right? Like we're not given data, uh, but we also have, we often have um, um, uh, the so-called Hamiltonian. And so we can use variational Monte Carlo to optimize this answer with respect to um, some uh, local Hamiltonian. Now, Juan, um, uh, be, uh, maybe before you continue, because there are questions related with all the learning stuff with maximum likelihood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, so let me, before I go on with the questions, so how much time do I have? Do I have, uh, it's already a break now, right? Or in a few minutes? No, not necessarily. I mean, okay. I think you have till three. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, so then, then I'll, I'm gonna have time, enough time. Okay, awesome. So let me go ahead with the question. So, so as uh, Lavi Kumar is asking, as you mentioned, Arnon is concerned about sequential data. Can we determine the time dynamics of the system? Um, for instance, uh, wave functions sequence in time. So I think, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the task is here, but uh, yeah, so you can determine some time dynamics in some systems and this has been explored. There's uh, exploration um, along those lines of like using uh, RNNs to explore real, uh, like some time dynamics, right? Um, so let me go ahead with a different question. So Sandeep is asking during sampling, is it necessary to take account of uh, fluctuations in sampling because sigma one is fitted into next uh, step sigma two. And as you have said, there is random probability sampling. So yeah, so you, uh, so when you're doing sampling, yes, you account for the, like um, the probabilistic nature of what you're trying to do, which is sampling. So uh, actually, so you, you output this, uh, say for instance, P of uh, sigma one in the first step, and then you do a sampling step. So you roll a coin or, or you roll a die. And then depending on the uh, outcome, you, you can get either up or down. And then you take that and you bring it back to the RNN to compute the condition, the P of a, a sigma two condition on that outcome. Okay. And so if you repeat this uh, multiple times, you will see sometimes you see up, sometimes you see down. And so you would have accounted for this. Um, mm, fluctuations that uh, Sandeep is mentioning. Uh, is there some uh, stochasticity in gradient descent? So in, the, so in principle, in gradient descent, uh, depending on how you, on your cost function, uh, on the training style, there's gonna be a stochasticity. So if you have a data set that is too large, then uh, like you, you would say, for instance, instead of taking the entire data set, to compute this uh, log likelihood, you would take only a fraction of it and use that to estimate the, the gradient. And so as you change the different uh, like pieces of data, then there's gonna be fluctuations due to the, to the fact that you're not using the entire data set. But if you use the entire uh, data, then there's no stochasticity in, in maximum likelihood estimation. But if you're doing variation Monte Carlo, then there's gonna be always, there's gonna always be um, stochasticity because, uh, because you cannot sum over the entire uh, Hilbert space. And so you will have uh, um, uh, 
uh, stochastic uh, stochasticity in, in the gradient. So that's a great question. Thanks. Um, uh, Valentin, uh, will it work for any kind of Hamiltonians or any uh, or only local Hamiltonians? Um, so yeah, so this is uh, for variational Monte Carlo, this is meant only for local Hamiltonians. If you have a non-local Hamiltonian, then there's um, uh, an intractability in a calculation of the gradients and on the calculation of the expectation value of the energy. So yes, yeah, so it's local. And then second question, uh, how the dimension of H define uh, physical reason? So the dimension of uh, the RNN is a uh, so-called hyperparameter. It's a parameter that you fix by hand. And what people do in practice is uh, the higher, the better, because it makes the model uh, more and more powerful, OK? Uh, and the physical reasoning is because um, uh, this uh, H is the, um, if you want, is the mechanism uh, through which you express correlations in a probability distribution or in a wave function. And uh, so, um, if you have um, um, a physical system with uh, strong correlations, then you want to make this um, uh, dimension high. Whereas if you don't have any correlation, for instance, if you have a mean field theory, um, then this dimension can be zero. And this wave function it becomes a mean field approximation. So this, uh, if you want, um, that's kind of how I reason about it. Like if you make it zero, then this wave, uh, this probability distribution is a product distribution or in the wave function case, this is a mean field theory. And as you make this um, dimension higher and higher, then you account, you're, you're capable of accounting for stronger and stronger correlations. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, um, I, Mahmoud is asking, sorry, I did not understand what approximation makes RNN behave linearly with uh, data size. Um, I don't understand the question. I, I don't think I made the statement that they behave linearly with data size, but uh, if you want to um, ask the question or clarify it, you're, you're welcome to do Mark Mood. Uh, hi. Uh, 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 in the uh, previous lectures, uh, uh, reducing the size of uh, uh, Hilbert space by uh, symmetric constraints or uh, locality, other locality constraints, we uh, decrease the size of the uh, data we need to run our calculations. I, I don't know what type of this approximation uh, can be used here. Uh, my uh, previous question in this uh, uh, post was, uh, the cutoff you apply on a conditional uh, probability was uh, in this respect. And uh, I don't know, uh, I don't understand uh, the uh, point here. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we don't um, apply cutoffs. Um, and the approximation that we make is that uh, uh, this like this restricted uh, sorry recurrent neural network representation cannot represent any conditional unless you make uh, this dimension of the hidden vector exponentially large, which we want to avoid. Okay, so if you made that um, uh, dimension of the hidden vector very large, then you could represent in principle any. Uh, any probability distribution p sigma. Okay, so the approximation is that we, by restricting the amount of um, correlation or the, um, uh, the size of the hidden state, you uh, impose restrictions on the type of conditionals you can represent. So that's what makes the RNN cheap, uh, but also less powerful than a generic approach where you do uh, tables, for instance, which is exponentially big. Um, there's a question by Tim. Um, so for a sequence sigma one through sigma n, do we assume Mark Markov property? So I answered that question uh, uh, earlier, I think. So there's no Markov approximation. So there's an effective Markov approximation um, by um, cutting, like putting a fixed, uh, a finite number in the dimension of the hidden state, which 
limits the type of like the distance over which you have correlations, but in principle, you don't do any Markov approximation. I think this is a very important question. By the way, uh, there's no Markov approximation. Effectively, uh, something like that happens, but it happens naturally because you cannot account for long, very long distance correlations. Um, there's a question by Lavi. So just to understand better, the RNN approach uh, you showed. Um, here is for the sequential data uh, of the system, for instance, calculate free energy as the temperature is decreasing. Then uh, we determine the ground state. Is it right? Um, that means uh, another way to determine the ground state. So it depends. So are you talking about uh, classical, the ground state of a classical Hamiltonian or the ground state of uh, quantum Hamiltonian? And in both cases, uh, you can do this, OK? You can do gr ground states where it's zero temperature uh, of uh, quantum many body systems. Um, but you can also use these approaches to compute the ground state of a classical Hamiltonian, which is an example that I have prepared for the next um, uh, uh, next session, like the for the second part of the lecture. OK. Um, OK, so let me so I won't go uh, through too many details of the RNNs with variational Monte Carlo. I'm going to assume you uh, have seen this, and I think you have last uh, week. Uh, you can use variational Monte Carlo um, to uh, estimate wave uh, ground states of many body Hamiltonians. Um, and you do that by simply computing the energy and its gradients. Okay, the gradients are, uh, they, they have this form. Um, it's not too important. It's just we're going to be using the same technique, gradient descent. Um, on uh, on the energy uh, expectation value of the energy of a Hamiltonian, a local Hamiltonian, and then we use the simplest parameter update. There are more complicated uh, update rules like uh, stochastic reconfiguration that I think Filippo Vicentini ex uh, explained last week, um, and so on. Um, but uh, let me uh, conclude with this, so, which is a beautiful example. It's related to a question I just got about whether you can get ground states of uh, classical Hamiltonians, and can you use this to um, uh, say, like for statistical mechanics problem. Uh, and so there's a way to do it, and it's, it's described in this very beautiful paper by Wu, Wang, and Zhang in PRL last uh, two years ago. So you can apply a variational approach to statistical mechanics, okay? So what, you, what this is, is you have a model distribution peak data that approximates the Boltzmann distribution at a finite temperature P, okay? So you may wonder why, why do you wanna do this? But, but let me, just bear with me. So, and so what you do is basically you try to uh, like have this probability distribution P match the Boltzmann distribution. And you can do this by optimizing the free energy of the probability distribution P data and you minimize it with respect to data, okay? So what is this uh, free energy is expectation value of a classical Hamiltonian or over this distribution P theta minus P times the entropy of the distribution, um, where H is a classical Hamiltonian and uh, the entropy, I'm afraid I didn't write the expression is, but it's basically sum over uh, the spin configuration sigma of uh, P uh, times log P, that's the entropy of the distribution. It turns out that um, if you use a recurrent neural network or uh, any autoregressive uh, uh, model or any normalized uh, uh, model such as the RNN, both the energy and the entropy are very easy to compute, okay? So then you can uh, use the, the same strategy to, to uh, approximate uh, statistical mechanics uh, problems, okay? So, so this is how you do it. So the free energy can be estimated from samples. And I explain how to obtain these samples from the RNN. And, and so basically you take a NS samples and then you compute this average over the so-called local free energy, okay? Which is basically um, F log is equal to H. So here I have the word target because of uh, something I'm gonna talk about, but uh, H say classical, the energy, this energy of the classical configuration sigma plus uh, the log of the probability P of sigma. And uh, as I said, I explained how to compute P, right? Like it's just this sequential process where you compute um, the probability of the RNA, 
of uh, configuration. So this is easy to compute actually. And, um, and then both the free energy, but also the gradients are easy to compute. Okay, uh, it turns out that uh, the gradients of the free energy, uh, you can compute using samples from the RNN. So you take NS samples and then you compute this one, the gradient uh, with respect to theta of the log of P on the samples that you saw times uh, the, the local energy, the, this local free energy. Um, and then what the, the, the thing that I haven't explained yet is how you get this gradients, which is again, this back propagation through time that I referred to uh, the lecture notes of uh, other groups. Um, in practice, we use automatic differentiation, which is a, a very powerful algorithm that allows you to um, compute the gradient of any differentiable um, uh, program you write. So this is very um, easy to implement. So almost you don't have to do anything. And then you use some simple parameter of data, data equals uh, data minus um, a small constant, the gradient of the free energy. And you iterate this until convergence. And, uh, and this is how you solve or like you approximate solutions to, to statistical mechanics uh, of programs. Um, I think that's it uh, for now. And uh, let's see if there are more questions. There are no more questions. Um, and so um, I guess, um, I think, is it time for a break now, uh, Alejandro? Alex. Uh, well, we can do a break now, I think. Uh, some minutes uh, as you need. Um, I, I can go on. It's up to you. Well, and if we well I think if break. It, yeah, let's, let's do a small break. Right, Tasia? Yeah, I think we can make a break until, well, we have 50 minutes by the program, so. Yeah. That. So we can have a coffee. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have maybe a coffee. Or... So uh, see you again at uh, 